I guess it's been a couple of months now when uh, I had a quick chat with uh, Father Jaime about doing some sort of a presentation here. And I told him I really like to talk about chaplaincy. Um, it's the one thing that ACCUS has given me, which has been a tremendous gift. And obviously my priesthood is something that I reverence and, and cherish tremendously. Now there's a lot of things I could be talking about today. Um, I'll be very frank with you, there's some issues about the LG, BLT situation which I would like to talk about with relation to myself, but not at this time. Because it would take a lot of time and I, have to, uh, I would like to develop that in kind of a prayerful surrounding. I will come back. I, I've been here a number of times and I will return. I promise that. Amen. Um, and I have another whole story along those lines. Um, and just to begin with, uh, I want to take just a quick, maybe 60 second view of who I am. Um, I've been through a lot of Jesuit schools. I've had kind of a straight line Catholic education, grade school, high school, university, Santa Clara University in San Jose, Gonzaga in, in, in Spokane, and then back to the University of San Francisco to get a, to get a master's in uh, education. Then I taught at Jesuit schools in Los Angeles and in Mexico for about, oh, well, just a little bit over four years. And, um, and then, in, well, I came back to San Francisco because I was questioning a whole bunch of things about vocation and about myself and about what I wanted to do. And I uh, met my future husband and uh, I returned to Mexico. We, you know, we married and returned to Mexico and um, we lived in Mexico City for three years. And I was the director of a school down there and I learned an awful lot about um, how to get along in a different culture and to adapt. I think adaptation has been one of the biggest lessons in my life. I've lived in a lot of cities. I lived in the four corners of the United States and in Mexico. And it's taught me to adapt to situations and to cultures. Um, I went to law school in San Francisco and went into the district attorney's office afterwards. I was there for five years. And then uh, we, moved to we moved to San Antonio, Texas. And I practiced law there and then Around the year, well, after my husband died, I um, I wanted to do something different, so I went back to the East Coast to Virginia because my daughter was living there with uh, grandchildren, so I wanted to you know, spend some time with them. And I was back there for about six years, uh, two of which were at the Catholic University of America. I studied canon law. It um, it was a tremendous experience for me, very challenging. One day, you have to hear this. This is true. We talked about the Roman Catholic Church. I had full intentions of becoming a canon lawyer. I thought it would be perfect. Having been a civil lawyer, prosecutor, and defense attorney, I thought, oh, canon law. And it just kind of really struck me. And one day, it was in November of 2007, we got to that part in canon law about the formation of priests. And um, I started asking questions about women in the priesthood. And the dean came up and called me out of class and said, um, if you bring up that topic one more time, we will dismiss you from the school. I mean, I was just stunned. I said, I'm in the wrong place. So, <coughs> so I left there and I went to, uh, to Austin and I spent some time at the Episcopal Seminary and I met some wonderful people, especially a lot of people from the Lutheran community. And um, in fact, I met one one Lutheran priest, J. Allen East, I introduced him to Father Jaime, and I think they've developed a friendship over the, you know, for the last couple of years. And um, then one day when I was, um, I was doing my, my web search, I found the American Catholic Church in the United States, and contacted, I guess it was Monsignor Spring in those years, and um, who's now my, he, he is still my spiritual director. And um, so they sent me all the paperwork and I made the application. And then Bishop, Archbishop Harms called me one day and said, um, how would you like to become a deacon? And I was kind of surprised. And he said, you have all the background, you got all the, all the education, and it looks like you have all the motivation, why don't you come on up? So I was ordained a deacon in April, and then he, he said, well, come back in, in June and you'll become a priest. Wow. So that was June 11th of 
In fact, Michael and I shared the altar that day, uh, June 12th of 2011, and it was a wonderful time. It just, it was a very deeply spiritually moving time. Um, and I, I want to mention this because this is part of the story that I'll tell, tell you guys a little bit later on. Um, Archbishop Harms invited me to stay with him for about two weeks before ordination. And I was very, very interested in that. And I had a, a chance to really sit down and talk to him. And I had some you know, personal questions about priesthood and sexuality, my sexuality. And, I, um, and we talked it all out very, very thoroughly. And I will come back to that at a later time, because today's about chaplaincy. OK. Now, one of the things that I've learned, well, when I first got to El Paso after ordination, um, I started thinking, what can I offer the community here? I had basically about three or four nickels to rub together, and really didn't, you know. Um, so I decided to look at a Catholic hospital to see if I could work there. And I signed up for Del Sol Hospital, and I was there for about two months. And then I realized that there was a county hospital. I thought my services could be a lot more useful in a, a county hospital, because there's a lot more poor people. And so I interviewed, and they were very excited. And I told them, I said, I'm an American Catholic priest. I'm not a Roman Catholic priest. Now, Anybody that spent more than five minutes in a Roman Catholic Church knows that women can't be priests in the Roman Catholic Church. So I got that out of the way. So when a lot of people came in, or well, when I would go into a hospital room, I'd have the collar on, my hospital badge that said I was an approved chaplain, and they took one look at me, and they could pretty much guess that I wasn't a Roman Catholic priest. So that, that was a little bit easier. Um, now, the one thing I had to do throughout all the time that I spent at the hospital, and I took a leave of absence last June to work on some spinal problems, which have really affected, really slowed me down quite a bit. I have, I have scoliosis. And according to the Department of Education, I'm permanently disabled, totally. But I can still work, I can still teach, I can still do what I want, and what I think is to the greater honor and glory of God. Um, but during those six years, I was challenged frequently um, about priesthood, not from patients and not from families, but from administration. And uh, I worked my way through that. And I came to realize that I think any of us that would go into a hospital chaplaincy situation need to go in with some really solid, well thought out um, positions about who we are. Now, the Archbishop you know, was very good this morning. He talked about some of those. But I'd like to talk a little bit more about them to, you know, to, you know, this afternoon. Now, a lot of our discussions over the years have been about a document called Christus, uh, Dominus Jesus, Lord Jesus. And in this document, in paragraph 17, it talks about our sacraments being valid sacraments. Okay? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I'm also going to talk about. Um, the 1983 Code of Canon Law for the Roman Catholic Church. Now, there's been only two editions of Canon Law. One was in 1917, it was all in Latin. Translations were prohibited, so not too many people understood Canon Law from 1917. And there was something like 2,500 different canons. Very, very legalistic. Um, it went from ideal to the letter of the law. Now, if you're driving down the street, the ideal would be drive safely. Well, with canon law, with the legalistic approach, it's you've got to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, very legalistic. So instead of just saying drive carefully and use good common sense, they, you know, they spell it out. And that's what they did in the 1917 code. And it was very wordy and very difficult to understand. Um, so in 1983, under the direction of John Paul II, he completely rewrote canon law, tossed out about a thousand of the canons, and was left with about 1,800 canons. And multi-language, every was translated practically into every language. Now, that particular code of canon law, um, there's, one, there's one particular canon, 8, 844, which I'm going to be talking about. 
Because um, to understand Dominus Jesus, which was written in 2001, 2002, it's really good to see this particular canon of canon law. Now, 844 says, Whenever necessity requires, and this is word for word from the 1983 code, Roman Catholic Code of Canon Law. Whenever necessity requires it, or true spiritual advantages should suggest it, and provided that danger of error or indifference is avoided, the Christian faithful, for whom it is physically or morally impossible to approach a Catholic minister, are permitted to receive the sacraments of penance Eucharist and anointing of the sick from non-Catholic ministers in whose churches these sacraments are valid. Now, as, we, as the Archbishop discussed this morning, we have valid sacraments. And our church embraces uh, the sacraments completely in a very Roman Catholic way, I think. Um, now, there's other churches, for instance, uh, you know, like especially Protestant churches that only recognize two sacraments the Eucharist and baptism. And the rest are commemorations and good to have around, but you know, we, we recognize all seven sacraments. Um, and also apostolic succession. I'm not gonna repeat what the Archbishop talk, you know, talked to us about this morning. You know, he actually saved me a little bit of time this afternoon. So apostolic succession and valid sacraments. Now, this was written in 1983. It was published in 1983. And that's canon 844, right here. Now, um, that canon is in five parts. Two, three, and four talk about um, the validity of our sacraments. And number five says, and this is very interesting, it says that if a bishop, a Catholic, Roman Catholic bishop, wants to criticize or publish something negative about anybody that's not in the Catholic Church, they have to contact the bishop of that particular church, or the prelate of that particular church. I don't think that's ever done. I don't think Roman Catholic bishops think twice about criticizing us or maybe being, being kind of critical. And I think they just bypass that, you know, that fifth section. And I'm gonna bring that up again to the archbishop, because uh, I think it's good for him to, you know, you know, for us to remember that. I was involved in a controversy with, uh, not a controversy with me, but with one of our priests who was with us at the time, Father Bob Connell, down in Charleston, South Carolina. The bishop there published in all of the Sunday bulletins on one given Sunday that Father Bob Connell was acting under the guise of a Roman Catholic priest and to beware of him. Well, if you take the words acting under the guise of, that sounds like fraud. That that they're deceiving the public by trying to say that they're Roman Catholic priests. Well, none of it was true. Uh, Father Bob wasn't doing it. He had never been a Catholic priest. He didn't go from being a Catholic priest to being a priest in the ACC US. So when I got down there, I have to mention one thing. When I was doing all this, Archbishop Harms told me, and this is before Archbishop Johnson, he said, don't talk about it with anybody. So I didn't. I brought it up after Archbishop Harms passed and well, I had a very lengthy discussion with uh, Archbishop Johnson about it. So I went down there for a whole week, and I demanded to see the bishop and the, um, the you know the head of the tribunal. And he brought in a couple of other priests. I think there were younger priests probably had gone to the same program that I did in Washington. And we sat down for about three hours and hashed this whole thing out. And I think they were kind of surprised that well, number one that. I understood canon law, that I was familiar with it. And I argued with him in a very, I think, intelligent and effective way. And they stopped doing that. They stopped publishing anything negative about uh, Father Bob. So I think that was successful. And, and maybe it sent a message to other Roman Catholic bishops not to, you know, not to be saying things that are blatantly false about any of us. Okay. Okay. So that was 1983. In around 2002, we had uh, a document called, came out that was called Dominus Jesus. Now, I'm going to spend 
probably the next 20 minutes talking about this particular document and about this particular book called Toward a Christian Theology of Pluralism. This is, is the book that inspired or that caused Cardinal Ratzinger at the time to write Dominus Jesus, which was signed off on by uh, uh, John Paul II afterwards, okay? He officially signed it. Now, in Dominus Jesus, in, um, I think it's in section 17, they specifically indicate that our sacraments are valid. And they use a lot of the same wording as Canon 844 from the 1983 Code of Canon Law. How, how did that come about? Well, it kind of comes about historically about 500 years prior to that, a lot of missionaries that were going to the Orient and China and India and those places were adapting the liturgy to the people. They said, if, if we're going to be able to communicate the message, we just can't do it in Latin, obviously, and we have to use local practices and local symbols and traditions uh, to communicate the message. And so they would translate the Mass and the sacraments into the vernacular, into the language of the people, whether it be in India or in China. The Vatican didn't like that. It didn't like that then, and it never has liked that idea. <coughs> so um, a lot of the early Jesuit missionaries that went to China and India were highly criticized and, and, and sanctioned by the Vatican, saying, you got to keep it in Latin. None of this vernacular stuff. And none, you know, they were afraid, I think, of losing the character of the sacraments in some way by putting them into the vernacular, putting them into the language of the people and the symbols of the people. Um, now, other religious groups at that time, especially around the 1700s, um, also went after the Jesuits for doing this, for trying to use the vernacular and local symbols because they, they felt that that was a desecration of the sacraments. Um, okay. Now, fast forward. Um, let's get up to a Jesuit priest. His name is Jacques Dupree. He is the author of this book, and it's spelled D-U-P-U-I-S. I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Dupree. Um, and he was a Jesuit. And he became a Jesuit in 1941. And after early religious and academic training in Belgium, he left for India in 1948. He taught at St. Francis Xavier Collegiate School in Calcutta. And he discovered Hinduism through the way it shaped the personalities of the students entrusted to him. It was a discovery, the variety of religions, and the beginning of a lifelong search. Does God, self, revelation necessarily pass through the person of Jesus Christ, or can it pass through other media? After being ordained a priest in India, he completed a doctorate in theology at the Gregorian University in Rome on the religious anthropology of origin of, origin of Alexandria. He was assigned to teach dogmatic theology at the Jesuit faculty of, of theology in, uh, in Delhi, and also um, became the director of a journal, uh, like a journal of theological reflection. and was also an advisor to the Catholic Bishops' Conference of India. So he was a very intelligent man, very well versed in um, Eastern religions. And in 1984, after 36 years in India, Dupree was called back to Rome to teach theology and non-Christian religions at the Gregorian University of Rome. His book, Jesus, um, well, toward a, a theology of uh, pluralism, um, was published around 1999, the year 2000. And um, this angered the Vatican. They didn't like this idea, again, of visiting with using Mideastern or Hindu types of symbols or language in order to communicate the gospel and uh, the sacraments. So, um, he was called back to Rome, and he was told to clarify his position in relation to that document. But he was never disciplined. He, they, you know, they didn't just put, you know, silence him. And um, 
but he had to, you know, respond to an awful lot of questions by the Vatican, and especially to uh, to the congregation of the faithful. Um, during this time, all this tension about his book caused him some health problems, and he eventually died uh, on December the 28th of, of 2004. Now, he was never formally um, censured by the Vatican, but they really questioned this book. And there's one section here I wanted to, do the, I wanted to read to you. Karl Rahner, who was a Jesuit theologian, talked about the anonymous Christian. And I read that when I was going through some studies in Austin. And it really talks about Christ manifesting himself through other religions and how people can be anonymous Christians. Maybe not as you know, participating in the Roman Catholic Church, but Christian in, you know, in their beliefs. Um, and one section here talks about the mystery of Christ in the religious traditions. Now, I promised that I would give this book to Angelita. So there's my gift, because I know that you're going to enjoy reading it. And I'm sure that she would you know, lend it out on a 24-hour basis, you know, to folks who ever wanted to read it. Okay. Now, Dominus Jesus and I think Canon 844 are the two documents that everybody should read if they want to do hospital chaplaincy. Because it gives us a good foundation and good arguments against people that want to challenge our, our priesthood or our church or whatever. Because um, it comes directly from, from Rome. As a lawyer, I have learned that whenever you want to discuss law, you have to use primary sources. And the primary sources are statutes, the letter of the law, and cases. How the Supreme Court or appellate courts interpret the law. Okay? Now, by using 844, you've got the letter of the law on your side. And if there's a question when you're going into a possible chaplaincy of, well, who are you? Well, have that information ready and show it to them and argue that point and feel comfortable with that. Now, I know I don't have too much time, so I, I want to kind of delve in directly into my experiences as a chaplain. Oh, by the way, this is um, a picture of my granddaughter that's about eight months old right now. Um, I mentioned this picture yesterday. and. Um, I just take a look at that picture and I, and I want to start crying, but anyway, and not out of sadness, out of joy. Okay. How did I get my chaplain's job? Because one of the things I wanted to, to talk about was how do you get your foot in the door of a chaplain seat? Well, so, I'm, I'm going to tell you how I did it. I applied not to get a job at, in the hospital, a paying job, but as a volunteer. And I felt once they get to know me and know what I can do and how dedicated I can be, I might be able to, you know, develop something. So, again, if you're going to volunteer as a hospital chaplain, don't give up your day job. You need that income coming in, okay? And I just say that very directly. Now, when I went into the University Medical Center in, uh, in, in uh, El Paso, I already had CPE. Now, CPE is defined as clinical pastoral education. I had one unit uh, through the school that I was studying at um, in San Antonio, and it was at Santa Rosa. And um, the book that I used, let's see if I have it up there. Yeah. This was the book that I always carried with me whenever I went into the hospital. It's called Pastoral Care of the Sick. Cuidado Pastoral de los Enfermos. On one side English, the other side Spanish. So it's perfect for everybody, especially in this room. Okay. Now, the website where you can order this, it costs about $18, um, is at Catholic Books, Catholic Books, plural, publishing.com. Okay, Catholic Books, publishing.com. I'm going to just check them out. <coughs> no, it's not plural. Catholic book publishing.com. Okay? So I had to go through some hospital training. It was a one-day seminar 
on what to do and not to do at the hospital. They gave us um, a flu shot, which we had to repeat once a year. And they also did that uh, tuberculosis test where they put a little bit of, um, well, it's just a little bubble that they put on your arm and they come back in two days and see if there's any reaction to it. Um, the one thing I learned about this is to keep a very, very low profile in the hospital. Do your job, do it well, but um, you know, don't, don't be a show off. Don't try to convert the whole hospital. <laughs> and I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, do your job, the word will get around that you're very efficient and that you really care about the people. I had to take a lot of weekend assignments, um, a lot of on call, sometimes uh, three and four calls a night. I would, get, I would get back home at eight o'clock and then they call at 10 o'clock and then I'd go and then get back home at 11.30 and then they call again at one. That didn't happen too often, but often enough to, um, to make me appreciate the job. Um, my whole attitude was to prove myself. Okay, and not by what I had to say, but what I did. Actions are louder than words. And after about six months, they offered me a stipend. And the stipend was $300 a month. And uh, that was a good complement to my regular salary of teaching, because I teach law at International Business College. So it was a good complement to that. And I also have Social Security. So those are my three sources of income. Um, now, some of the rules that I followed in dealing with patients was basically not to try to preach or to walk into a room and start telling everybody about the church or anything. Let me show you exactly what I would do. Imagine Angelita there as the patient, okay? And you all are family. I would walk in and I would make sure that they saw the collar and the badge. And my first question was something like this. Uh, las oraciones en inglés o en español. Would you prefer the prayers in English or in Spanish? Okay, and they would tell me right away. And then I would always ask them, "Is the Our Father okay? Está bien con el Padre Nuestro?" That's the universal prayer of all Christian religions. And they would say yes or no, and then I would just get right into the prayer. I didn't try to sell myself and say I'm a Roman, I'm an American Catholic priest, blah blah blah. No. If they wanted to find that out, they could come up to me afterwards and ask me about it. But if they didn't ask me, I just wanted to get into the prayer. Uh, prayer was the icebreaker. It got me into, um, you know, asking the Holy Spirit to come. And whenever I walked into the hospital, I had this one prayer in mind. Lord, let me speak as you would speak. Let me think as you would think. Let me feel as you would feel. Not me, but you. Use me as your subject to communicate yourself to the patients and to the family. And to me, I felt that gave me a tremendous sense of peace and confidence. Because I walked into some situations that uh, were really, really difficult. Now, don't forget, um, I, I didn't mention this, but I was a police officer in San Francisco for a while. And I saw a lot of ugly things. And I even had to pull the trigger on somebody at one time. And that was a very traumatic event. I didn't talk about it for 30 years. Um, Now, in my first couple of months, you know, I had, you know, I worked with patients. I didn't work with the patients, but mainly with the families of, like, I, I remember this one boy, he was 18 years old. He came in with a bullet to the back of his head, and he was dead by the time he got to the hospital. And I felt very sorry for him. And the family, I think one of you all mentioned about traumatic shock. Michael talked about that. And I couldn't communicate with them because they, they couldn't listen. They were so shocked and so depressed and so, this, you know, this kid was an 18-year-old senior in high school. And um, they were just overcome with shock. When they're like that, you can't talk to them. You can just be there and maybe offer a prayer. And that's about it. Because the rest of it is, they, they just don't get it. And it isn't their fault. They're just in a very, very negative emotional state. And I felt very sorry for the kid. And um, then about a month later, they caught the guy that shot him. And then it turned out that he was shot because he had shot somebody else. It was a retaliation kill. And I, I really went into a lot of prayer about that. Another case that I had was of this little girl. She was three years old. 
Uh, she was in a car with her mother, her grandmother, her aunt, and then the, the father wasn't there, thank God. But they were traveling 70 miles an hour along 375, which is a big freeway there. And a soldier from Fort Bliss was speeding at 270 miles an hour, the wrong way down the freeway. Crashed into them, so the combined impact of 270 plus 70, that's 340 miles an hour impact. All the adults died. Obviously, they were, you know, they died right on the spot. And when I walked into that little girl's room, um, her head had been uh, stapled together. Uh, it, you know, it was a very kind of a very, you know, scary thing to see. And they had to shave off the top of her, uh, of her head. And um, you know, I prayed for her. And the father was there, and I, and I didn't think she was going to make it. The next day, I walked in. She's sitting up in bed. Drinking a McDonald's Coke. I said, well, that's, a, that's an improvement. Whenever they sit up and, and eat, that's pretty good. The next day I went in there, she was sitting on the corner, on the side of the bed, arguing with her father about something. And I said, if she's arguing, she's good. I mean, she's good to go. And she was out of the hospital in a week. Um, to me, that was kind of miraculous. Um, I walked into the, a, a room of, of, of a young boy who was about 10 years old one time, and he was sitting up in bed talking, and, and the nurses said he's going to die in about two hours. I said, it didn't look like he was going to die in two hours. So I went out and talked to the nurses and said, yeah, this condition is such that he will be dead in two hours. So um, I talked to the mother, and I gave her a crucifix and said, put this in your home, and when you see the crucifix, pray for me and pray for your son. Um, and she really appreciated that. Now, there's something I want to talk about, and this is really, really important. When I was there, there were three other Roman Catholic chaplains. And these three, after I got there, about, about six months later, all three of them got fired by the hospital. And I was the only sacramental priest left. And you can imagine, I, I didn't know what was going on in the beginning, but I found out that the Center for Disease Control came in and because of cameras they could see how the priest was putting holy oil on his thumb and then anointing the patient. Well they said we don't want that, we don't want people, we don't want chaplains to be touching the patients. And these three refused, they said that's, what, that's the way we have to do it. So they said okay we have to fire you and all three of them got fired. And the bishop of uh, El Paso didn't quite like that. So I came up with the idea of these pads. And so what I developed was, okay, I would take the pad, put the holy oil on the pad, and then anoint the patient using this pad. The CDC liked that idea, and they congratulated me for it. And then oh, about a year later, after doing this quite a few times, now you can buy these at Walgreens, they're very, very inexpensive, um, or any drugstore. Um, I walked into a room where the father was dying of acute alcoholism and his liver was shot. And his son was standing there, he was about maybe 11 or 12 years of age, and very, very deeply sad that his father was dying. So after I did the anointing, something said, give it to the kid, let the kid anoint. So I did, and he blessed his father, and then I invited the other people, there were about three other people in the room, his ex-wife and his daughter, um, and they anointed the patient. And I called Archbishop Har um, Harms, I called Archbishop Johnson, and I said, is this okay? Can, can I do it this way? And he said, yes, that's fine. So I found that to be very, very beneficial because the, the family can bond with the sacrament. They feel a part of the sacrament. It gets them praying for the person. They feel like they're kind of giving the person their love by anointing them. It's a very simple thing, and then I would just dispose of this properly afterwards. Okay. Um, I had a couple of very interesting cases. One case um, was a woman, I walked into the room and the nurses were saying, you have to go and see this for yourself. I kind of thought, well, I've kind of, you know, I've been, I have been there for about four years already and I thought, I, I kind of thought I, I had seen everything. Well, it was a woman, she just looked like a, a very nice housewife um, and she was sitting up in bed and these sounds were coming out of her like horses and mules. I kind of thought, God, what is this? And the thought came to my mind, 
possession and that kind of thing, but you know, the one thing you never want to do is jump to that kind of a conclusion because it might be something deeply psychological, it could be something uh, neurological, whatever. And I called the Archbishop about it and, um, and I told him I didn't think I should be performing an exorcism. The nurses all wanted me to perform an exorcism and I didn't think it was appropriate because for a whole bunch of reasons, and we can discuss it at a later time. So I did pray for the person, and, and then left, and um, and that was the end of it. But it was very, I'll never forget that, because I keep wondering, was the person really possessed or not? But I'll, and I'll never know. Because afterwards, I think she was highly medicated and, and put into the psychiatric ward. Um, one time that was very interesting, and I'll kind of end with this story. Um, a man had been shot in Las Cruces. Las Cruces is about 40 miles from El Paso. It's on the New Mexico side. And he, had, he was walking out of his mobile home and he had this toy gun in his hand. And there was a report that uh, he was um, committing some sort of spousal abuse or whatever. And so when the police got there, they saw the gun and shot him. Okay? And then the helicopter came and brought him to our place in El Paso and he died there. And Within about a half an hour, uh, I, I guess about five or six cars from Las Cruces showed up, and there were about maybe about 20 people that all wanted to go in to, to see the body in the OR. Well, one thing that you're going to find out is that anybody that dies because of a gunshot wound or any kind of criminal activity, the OR is considered part of the crime scene. They can't let people in there, and they shouldn't. There's blood all over the place. And so I... I went outside and the whole crowd was out there and I said, God, give me some strength. What am I supposed to say? So I thought of going to the person that looked the oldest and was a woman. And she was kind of like the matriarch of the group. So I went up to her and said, I need you to pray with me. So I said, we're all going to pray. And I put my arm around her. And so we prayed and it calmed the whole group down. And I said, look, there'll be plenty of time to see the body when you go to the funeral parlor. So um, wait till then out of respect for the hospital and respect for the family. They accepted that. But there were so many times when people were yelling and screaming about, oh, I have to go in and see the body. Well, hospitals don't like that because a lot of times that, you know, that particular scene, it could be a criminal scene or contagious scene or whatever, it's better, well, the hospital won't let them in. So you have to talk to these people. And the one thing that we had at, at the hospital was a quiet room. The quiet room was where you would take the family away from the body and away from um, the OR and just sit down with them and uh, talk to them. And sometimes if they weren't in traumatic shock, um, you could and, and pray with them and, and kind of help them. Um, and I always use the Our Father. It was the universal prayer. To me, you can't go wrong with God's own words. When he said this is the perfect prayer, it is the perfect prayer. Um, the one last case I want to talk about is at the very beginning when I started learning how to be a chaplain. I was in Santa Rosa Hospital, and this will be my last story. Um, if you are in my class and, uh, you know, at the school, you know, the uh, students all complain that I tell too many, too many stories, but they appreciate it because they experience the same thing out there in the uh, law offices. Anyway, I got a call at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. I was the only chaplain in the hospital. And this hospital is big. It's really big. It's now part of Chris's health uh, system. And the nurse said, we're going to disconnect two baby boys from life support. They're twins. But they have some sort of a, con a congenital problem. They're not going to live more than a day. And uh, they're in incubators. That, that was their life support system. And the mother had never touched the children, ever, because of the fact that they put them right into this, these two incubators. Uh, so I got up there. I said, "What am I going to do? I mean, I've never had, I had never done this before. How, how am I going to talk? I mean, what am I going to say?" So I called one of the other chaplains, a woman, and I said, "Give me some ideas." And she said, "There's a couple of Roman Catholic books down there that have some really good prayers for the burial of children. Adapt those. You can adapt those pretty quickly." So the first gospel that I read was, "Suffer the little children to come unto me," and. The other one was, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. As a matter of fact, this card was given to me, I think by, by Father Vince. Uh, it was uh, 
in loving memory of Archbishop Harms, April 3rd, 1946 to April 28th, uh, 2012, and it's Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Okay, so as I started to pray, they started disconnecting life support. And as I was praying, I would kind of look out of the corner of my eye at the people, and I could see the tremendous effect of the Word of God on these people. And it wasn't me. It was the Word of God through me to them. And there were nurses there. There were relatives there. Uh, there must have been about 20 to 25, and they were very deeply engulfed in the prayers that I was offering. I thought to myself, this is what it's all about. It's being the messenger of God, bringing God's Word to these people. And I felt a tremendous sense of peace, and I realized this is the focal point of my ministry. It's not about me, it's about God. And make sure that it's never about me. One last word about money and donations. Um, I learned, and this is part of hospital rules, you can never, ever ask for money from families. If they want to donate something, that's, that's okay. I had a long discussion on the phone with uh, Archbishop Johnson, and he told me very specifically, if they offer a donation, accept it. Don't turn it down. But don't ask for money. Okay, so that's the rule that I've been following. Um, and I'll be, I'll be back in hospital chaplaincy in January. I want to do a little bit more therapy in my back and get, get a little bit more strength. Um, so, the other thing that is important is HIPAA. HIPAA means Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act from 1996. I sent you all an email. Did you all get that? It had, it had the four attachments, and that included HIPAA. And so my homework, God, I sound like I'm back in school. Your homework is to read those and ask me questions about them later. You can just direct the questions to me by email or call me, okay? I'm, I'm more than willing to continue this discussion with you by phone. Um, any questions? <laughs> 